Uh, hi everyone, um, Aaron. I'll be the host for the space today. I might be expecting a co-host if they will be able to join. And also I can, I'm expecting more speakers. Uh, maybe one thing to do, if you can hear me react with an emoji so that I, I can I can be sure that we are together. Okay, yeah, uh, react with your favorite emoji so that you can get started good. So I can see you have speakers. Maybe if this is for disclaimer. Uh, most of them will be joining and dropping. Uh, I hope everyone understands that this is like uh, midday in US. So most of them are uh, working. So we are staying some few minutes from them. Uh, we'll give them like uh, five, three minutes for others to join, but we'll start with an introduction. Others will catch up as we go on. Uh, we expect them to have three speakers. Uh, uh, that is Madonna uh, S. Wambua, who is an Android engineer, CTO. Uh, maybe if I say just an Android engineer, I should add how that she also hosts uh, a podcast that you can check from her bio. And also, uh, she is a CTO and founder of Labs. Then we have Habia Masira. Um, if you have listened to these pieces for the longest time you have been hosting them, you know that you have been having Masira Ladomri. So this is not the first time you are having him. Uh, okay. Uh, the other person that we should have who might be joining it after the course uh, is Juma. So he is engaged somewhere, but as soon as he is done, he will hop in and also contribute here and there. Uh, with that said, um, if you have a question that you want addressed, please drop them in the chat. Um, okay. Uh, the other part is, if you're looking for a position, just drop it in the chat. And if you know a job somewhere, just reply with uh, that a uh, link to that job so that you can help others. Also, you can reply in the chat with your favorite freelancing website or platform that you use for freelancing so that uh, others can know where to get jobs. Good, so Grace or John, if you're able to join as co-host, I would appreciate that so that you can help each other in case I drop out. Uh, good. Um, I can see we have quite a good number, almost, uh, uh, you can see 90 plus. Uh, okay, that is the number that I can see. So I think we are good to start. Uh, okay, uh, hi everyone, I'll be your host again. I help lead Lux with um, Chris, with John, with Daisy, and someone else called John Hope. Uh, okay. I tend to say we are past adults, so yeah, we are there. Uh, today I'll be your host and professionally work at FCB Bank as a data engineer. Uh, so basically that's me. I'll be hosting three people in the call, but I also expect anyone who is free to contribute. And again, if you know a job somewhere, please reply in the chat. If you're not a freelancing platform, reply in the chat. So today we'll be talking about how to get a job in the um, how to get a tech, a tech job or job in tech industry, especially with the current economy. You hear now there are also layoffs at a certain company, there are also a layoff, there is other companies that are hiring at different rates, so uh, the field is mixed up and we have so many people who are joining the tech, so yeah, it's wise to know what to do differently to earn a job or how to start out. So we will start with a simple introduction. Uh, Abel Masira is a full stack engineer. Madonna is a mobile uh, engineer, um, CTO and author. She has written a book and also hosts a podcast. Then we have Juma, who is a senior Android engineer also at Smile. So Abel, say hi. I know. Yeah, say hi, introduce yourself, what you do. We can start with. Oh, oh uh, thanks, Aaron. Hope you can hear me clearly, right? Yeah. All right. So yeah, my name is Abel Masila. Um, I'm a staff engineer at CAS AI, uh, doing most of the things there. I've been doing tech for some time now, say 
nine years, eight years, can't tell. Uh, my biasness is in front-end front -end, uh, development. Of course, I do other things, a software engineer. I work for CAS AI, I also work for hotel engineers, a senior front-end engineer there. Both of these companies are in the US, one is in Denver, the other one is in San Francisco. Uh, it's been, it, I'd say it's been a good journey, uh, full of challenges and learning and all the stuff in there. I uh, would attribute uh, my remote working experience to Andela, joined Andela back in 2019. It's been a good ride, can't complain, I'm enjoying working there. And uh, apart from development, I love cars and anything in between there. So you'll find myself breaking my car or building it. Uh, and that's about me. I no longer tweet a lot. Last year I used to, I no longer tweet. You can always reach to me uh, through LinkedIn or if you have my personal mail, yeah. Also, you are a mentor. Are you still mentoring oh, at APD list? I used to mentor last year uh, uh, through an EP list. I'm getting back to mentorship after a long break, which has been close to three months of not doing active men mentorship. But as from this month, I'm going back to mentorship. I'm going to be doing mentorship still through ADP list and mentor list which is our local uh, developed platform for mentorship. Shout out to Specia Tech guys. They are done some good stuff. I'm logged in and seen how the stuff has been set up. So if you are looking for mentors in web, backend, AI space, uh, you can ping me. We can, we can talk and have a schedule and probably get you going. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have Madonna. I know I introduced you halfway, so you can introduce yourself. Go on. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me today. I think I've actually posted like a link to my website because I think there's a lot to what I do <laughs> uh, based on what I've realized. And um, it's an honor to be here today and to be talking about this topic. And I think I might have different experience, but I'm hoping that I can shed light on some of the questions that anybody might have. So I've been in the software engineering field for now, I think I think I would say that 10 years. I'm very old, as you can see. And um, apart from that, I think I do, I actually started enjoying communities more around 2019 is when I started getting engaged with the community more. And that's because of just pure isolation, especially in the United States, because I live in the United States. And then um, I also started a YouTube channel where I, I, I'm planning to be uploading more videos on just building for Android. So for the longest, I've been doing inventory systems and then mobile development. But now I do all around it and I decided to start my own company, like a startup idea. You know, when you've been in the industry for long, you're like, OK, what else can you do? And uh, it's been super fun. So I think we should be looking for talent pretty soon. And one thing that somebody told me is that, hey, why not look for talent in Kenya, you know? And I was like, yeah, I think that would be a pretty good place to start. So I'm super excited to be here and hoping that people will learn one or two from me. That's all about me. Oh, not all about me. I'm also a mom. I have two kids and I'm married and we stay in New York with my husband. That's it. Oh. Good. <clears throat> Thank you for creating time. Uh, I know it's working time for everyone, especially for the speakers and most of the guys, especially who work with West uh, Eastern Time, uh, that is US-based company. So we also have Grace who will be helping me as a call. So Grace, say hi, tell us what you do. Hi everyone, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, my name is Grace as, as I have been introduced. I am a technical mentor at DigiFunzi. I deal with robotics and AI. I am also a community manager, um, currently managing DC Africa and also Zindi community. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, Grace will be helping me co-host. So also in case you have something to put in, you can tell us. So everyone has given their story. Habel has given several. We also have a YouTube uh, video of him. I'll be sharing later. Also, Madonna, I think we have hosted that and recorded the call. It's in the on, on YouTube, so you can check it there too. So just drop to the questions that we have for them and topics that I felt were important to discuss. So the first question is understanding what skills do employers value most in current tech landscape and how important is continuous learning? Uh, oh, those are the those are two questions. So I think we can start with Masira. You can tell us about the skills in his niche, and also Madonna can tell us about the skills in a or uh, in a niche uh, that is the Android hardware software. And no one else want to contribute also can listen and then we can add them. So you can start with Habe. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Haram. Um, uh, things have changed uh, between the last quarter of 2023 and Q1 24. Uh, as you all, you all know, uh, companies are still, are still hiring, but uh, different paces and with different requirements uh you can't say that the, the what we are going through right now is what we went through in 20 2019 or so um the core uh technical skills still stand you need to have solid understanding of your data structures and programming languages proficiency in any of them which you are good at and where uh, the, the language which the people are looking to hire and you're also looking for employment through um of course, uh, right now we have all the outburst of AI all over. Uh, in a good one, in a bad way, it's affecting our tech scene. Uh, so I would say your mastery of your AI uh, stuff. Uh, if you are an engineer, say building, expert in building, deploying, maintaining AI ML solutions would be uh, something for 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 you to look out at uh we have also cloud computing i would say uh, uh when i was starting my career we used to say back-end engineers will do the cloud stuff for us uh, i think we are past that now anybody can do can take on uh, cloud stuff that includes cloud architecture development and also security involved in that uh of course cloud native technologies they are here to stay. They have been here. People have been hyping them. They are important. Most companies live by them. That's Docker, Kubernetes, and all that nice stuff. Uh, that is on the technical side of things in time, uh, in, yeah, when it comes to web, and I would say mostly front and back end. Uh, of course, uh, you can't just be a technical person without some soft skills. Um, in recent times, we have uh, had people who can't communicate very well because you all work in your houses, you don't go to any office, you probably not have interacted with so many people in the last year or so. So effective communication, both written and verbal is crucial. And also clear, it also gives uh, your colleagues uh, your perspective of things clearly. And of course, clear information sharing is important. Uh, also being adaptable to continuous learning, which I think most of us are usually uh, striving to, uh, is don't say that you are you have known everything in tech. Tech is constantly growing, uh, so you being able to learn quickly and adapt to changes is quite valuable right now. Mark you, we have a huge lot of people who are not employed and they are willing to do all these stuff. Uh, this stuff which you are doing uh, probably at a, at a cheaper rate. So you being able to adapt quickly and learn quickly is something uh, which people are looking at right now. Uh, say, of course, uh, there are so many ways of you uh, being stay tuned to the updates. Of course, if you are a new, if you are beginner, of course, online courses will come uh, handy. Coursera, EDX, Udemy. Uh, of course, some blogs and their professional networking and conferences and also mentorship will come in handy uh, to help you improve on the soft skills and also on the technical skills. 
Um, I would say most people are lacking the basics to their programming languages right now. You see all this hype on YouTube, like learn React in two days, learn JavaScript in two days, learn Node.js in two days. It's quite it it's it's quite annoying that somebody wants to lie to you that you'll be able to be employable in two days. So I think if you can uh, sit back, learn the basics, it's gonna help you with the interviews and uh, ace most of the technical uh, bit of your interviews. Okay, thank you. Uh, where do you think like a beginner who is passionate about front end should learn from? That is one. And where should they look for jobs? Like, where do you think we have most front end jobs uh, listed? Uh, if 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 you if you are looking into front end engineering, I think the best place to go is front end masters, and don't go direct to the to the front end things. Learn the basics. There's a course on front end masters which I usually tell my my mentees to check out. It's it's by Will Sentence. It's called JavaScript: The Hard Parts. Uh, you can't do lots of front without JavaScript. It's 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 all hosted on frontendmasters.com. Uh, that's an online platform, just go there. I think it's forty, thirty dollars a month. Uh, if you're having struggles paying that and you really want to do it, kindly DM me. If I have the money, I'll help you maybe halfway. We, you you can never know. Uh, I I think that's, that's a good place to start. Uh, Front-end jobs are all over. Uh, if you go to LinkedIn and tailor your searches to, uh, if you're looking for remote roles, you can tailor your searches to the, the US. I see people now doing Germany and Berlin and all that nice stuff. Uh, if you're looking for a location, I think Germany is one of the countries where people want to go. Uh, I also see people doing Dublin if you want to relocate. Uh, tailor your search to on-site or uh, remote those countries. It's quite easy to get roles on LinkedIn. If you can afford to pay LinkedIn premium, you'll get you'll be able to get some tips on how to improve your applications, how to improve your LinkedIn profile, and all that nice stuff. Uh, of course, referrals go a long way. I think uh, locally, I think Candela is one of the places where you can get an easy referral, and then being on the talent pool, and uh, your persistence is gonna help you get a job in the US or any other place. Uh, I think there are so many, many other sites you can you can get remote uh, front-end roles. I'm gonna share them on this tweet. You can check them out. Uh, the goal is to keep an open mind. Uh, if you are young, I'm not young, I may not be able to relocate to the US. I have a family, I have not one, not two kids. I have two kids actually, so I can't easily go to the US. But if you are quite young and you have the energy, not so much to put to get them and to want to go to work in the US. Keep an open mind when do the applications. If they are offering uh, visa uh, sponsorship for, for you to go to the to, to the country of your choice where you want to work, keep an open mind. Most of these most of these people are hiring. They usually have some weird statements. US remote, uh, UK remote, UAE remote. You need to know to look out for that so that when you apply, you're increasing your chances of being hired. Back to you, Harun. Uh, thank you. Uh, the same question will go to Madonna, but I received a DM, maybe I'll share with her. Someone is saying you're so inspiring, uh, how you manage to work and manage family and help community. Maybe you don't know, but Pia Bella Kwapo Henry. Uh, Madonna, on the same question, like which uh, which skills do you think are more valuable in the tech in the current tech landscape, especially in hard right? Uh, and uh, also you can mention how important continuous learning is. Uh, also you can share like a small tip on uh, like okay, just answer those questions, then I'll drop the other question after that. <laughs> That's very funny. Okay, I think uh, Masila did. I think I, pron I hope I'm pronouncing the same. Name. Okay, okay, I just checked. I think Masila said so many great points. I think the only point I would really insist insist on is just be good at what you do. 
I feel like, especially now with so many people who are very talented and many people looking for jobs, just be good at what you do. And why is this important? This is important because, for instance, in the US, we have so many layoffs happening. So if you're laid off today, what are you going to use to get the next job? You just have to be very good, right? So I would definitely say spend time, try to understand your craft very well, and then be ready. Now, the other thing I would definitely say is network, network, network. I know this is not the first time you've had this quote that your network is your net worth, but networking is very important, especially during this time, because you'll be able to get your next job, like just through a referral. And then lastly, if you want to become good, let's say, for instance, in, um, let's say Android, for instance, I think I would say definitely staying updated through documentation and also following, like, I, I think Google Developer Experts program is pretty good and we have great, great experts, for instance, Harun. I know other great experts around the world, like David, I think it's called David Okari, and then other great ones. So definitely staying updated on what they're sharing really helps a lot because every expert gets like knowledge about what's happening in the Android world way in advance because we are always insiders. So you get information about what's happening very early in advance. So I would say again, just to summarize, because I know Masila spoke so much about this. Number one, be good at what you do. Network, network, network. And then thirdly, connect with people who know what's happening in, in your tech stack. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So I have a question, like um, I've seen several jobs, like Masila said, which says uh, remote US. So does that mean someone in Kenya who applies for any other country, uh, let's say in Africa, has to relocate to US for that job? Um, well, yeah, I think that's a very good question. And um, honestly speaking, I think I've heard of serious issues about remote jobs. And one thing that I can say is that when I came to the United States, I came for studies. That's very different. And after my studies, I got my first job. Now, if you come in the way of, of, of uh, let's say, work, it's very different because you get a different type of visa. Now, the only challenge I've seen is that if it says remote, let's say US, it might mean here. But if it says remote worldwide, it means you can work from anywhere remotely. Now, what you need to look for when you're hunting for those jobs is first look for the role that says remote everywhere, because then that is specifically telling you that, hey, you can actually be anywhere to get this job. It doesn't mean you will relocate to the US, but from time to time, that particular company can have, let's say, like um, uh, employees get together where they can actually fly you into the United States. And that's a nice way to like come meet your team. But mostly what I've seen is that it just says remote US. It really means here in the United States. That's where you need to be remotely located to get the job. I might be wrong on this, but that's my understanding. But I would say if you're looking for specific roles that have like like say explicit explanation it has to say remote worldwide or everywhere and that means anywhere anybody anywhere can actually take that job now i've seen a couple of bias being in the us for long is that they might hire people in the uk <laughs> because you know that bias exists but definitely i would say just look for that keyword everywhere, remote, everywhere, or remote, worldwide. Or you can always ask too. There's no pain in asking about that job. If you know you're, you're qualified, just ping them and ask them, hey, I am currently here. Can I apply for this job? Because one thing that I've also noticed in the US, they hire a lot of um, South Americans for remote roles because it's much easier. But I've never seen them say, like, let's say remote, like US or but then it's, they still get the jobs from, like, let's say. So something else I'll definitely say is for people, like, hey, look, you can actually tap into the Canada market or the South American market, which makes you easier to come to the American market because the American market is definitely is getting very competitive. That's my thought. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have this question. It's kind of personal but also uh, someone requested I ask. Uh, the question is like, you might be in based in Kenya, you don't have the permit to work in US, but again, you're not denied the chance to work in US. 
when asked the question like are you legally okay i don't know how the question is but i think you'll relate like the question ask you if you are allowed to work in us should you say no or yes yet you're not allowed yet you're not denied the chance to so how would you answer that question okay i think if I'm getting the question correctly, you're asking, let's say I live in Kenya and I'm not legally allowed to work in the US, can I still take a job? Is that the question? Yeah. I think this is what I would say. I've seen many people, for instance, Masila said he does work for a couple of companies that are based out in the US. So I think it's very possible for anybody to work legally from Kenya for the US companies. Now, I have a company here and definitely I can hire from Kenya, but there are laws that definitely have to follow and go through. So I definitely think it's it's okay, you can do that. Anybody can apply for a role here. Now, the only challenge is that I know people might experience being underpaid. And I know there's a policy actually right now by the US government to cut down on those international jobs because they're like, hey, look, you're underpaying people. And then you're taking advantage of laborers let's say from india mostly i think that's a country that's pretty exploited by that and then they're like hey look you need to pay people fairly because you know they pay them less money and then you're in a different country so i would definitely say don't be discouraged definitely apply for instance i know a couple of companies that have branches maybe in san francisco or new york and they have branches in Kenya. For such companies, it's much easier to get in. For instance, I know branch is big. I know a couple of others, so definitely apply. And then banks too. I don't know why people don't, I mean, and this, this is something I've experienced also here in the United States, where everybody thinks that they can only work for tech companies. I think we need to change our mind, mindset because banks need tech people. Education needs tech people. I mean, motor vehicle needs tech people. So I would say expand your horizon. Don't just look beyond a tech company. For instance, I met a girl from Kenya and she now works for, for what is this car? The Volvo car in Sweden. So definitely more opportunities, but in a different field. So not, not field, sorry, but in a different, uh, what is it called? Like a, not a tech tech company. So I would definitely say when you're searching, don't be limited just only for searching for tech companies. No. Knock your doors everywhere. Look into, let's say, motor cars. Like, for instance, let's say, um, like, what is it called? Like Mercedes. They're always hiring. Honda, you know. They might have, like, an international branch in Kenya. You never know. So that's just an opportunity where you cannot say, oh, I never thought about this. But let me see if they have openings that I can try. And you might find that they're actually hiring engineers from Kenya like to work in their Mercedes farm or just an example. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. So I would say definitely don't hold yourself back. Apply, apply, but don't apply only to tech companies. Look for other companies too, because I think everybody needs tech, especially now, you know, there's a lot of uh, AI and stuff. So yeah, you will get lucky. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe, the second, the other question will be taken by Grace, uh, will be asked by Chris. Uh, but I had this question for Masira because he might be dropping for a short call, then you'll join us. So the question to Masira is like, uh, what, okay, let me say this. I've seen all hand what you do and yeah, uh, maybe what makes a software engineer like stand out and especially in current roles in Kenya, like what advice would you have to someone who has less than three years in front end? Uh, that goes to Masira. Uh, almost dropping off, but I'm going to share some insights on this. Uh, what will make you stand out as a intermediate or uh, just slightly above junior or entry-level uh, front-end engineer is, I would say, mostly uh, an eye to details. Uh, front-end engineers are people building stuff for users to see. Uh, so I would say uh, if you're a front-end engineer, uh, you need to have a good eye for good designs. Also have some nice, nice mastery of, of course, JavaScript and a framework of your choice or a library. Now we have both, which are quite important. Uh, 
of course you need to be you, you you need to know how to live with people interact communicate with stakeholders uh what, what, what as you climb the ladders of employment uh it becomes less technical and more of a communication kind of thing where you need to talk a lot and document a lot and probably listen a lot and also give feedback a lot so you need to be able to to be the person who is quick to receiving feedback give feedback uh write lots of notes uh design documents and whatnot um and of course have lots of empathy uh it's more of a personal trait not everybody has that but you can of course learn and and, and of course acquire that uh of course you don't need to stop learning i know when when you get to the mid level stage you feel like you have learned a lot and to you, you want to say that you are the superstar and all oh, that's nice i was there uh, i wouldn't say it's, it's it's a bad say to be at but when you feel like you have learned a lot it's the time you don't know much so it's the time to learn and keep on learning and practicing and of course uh risking it all for yourself um uh, I would also say that uh, uh, with uh, with with the progression in your front end career, it 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 goes beyond libraries and frameworks and UI uh, enhancement tools. It's more of your personal understanding of the basics. So if you are good CSS, you are good at CSS. It's gonna help you a lot. I know CSS is so easy and it's always and it's so hard at the same time. Uh, people don't talk about it also people talk about it so if you can have some proper understanding of css uh as you, you know as a front end you can't you can't avoid that uh yes i know you can do tailwind like, you know you can pick up material ui and you can pick up fun design but do you understand what's happening can, if I, I give you a proper animation on figma can you be able to uh, execute it it's not on hand design it's not on on tailwind can you be able to sit down plan and execute on that uh and as you as you grow you need to also to also to be able to give back uh in your role in your capacity the more you give back the more you learn a lot this includes speaking a little bit more uh, uh guiding uh, juniors or people just um, at the same level with you with the knowledge you have acquired it's going to broaden your understanding of things which you know and things which you don't know uh yeah i think i think those are some of the the things i would highlight for somebody looking to grow their career from junior to mid level three years plus in the experience of professional experience of developing uh front end apps uh don't be limited to just front end ex keep on exploring i think when i started as a, as a as an engineer I was not a front end engineer but i found by my biasness through experimenting i was more of a erp backend guy database and whatnot but when i started trying react in 2017 i figured man this is what i need to be doing and so keep on practicing and and experimenting you may be, you may find some some something else which you're interested in in the front end space could be ui ux could be product design and management and all that stuff Thank you. Uh, Madonna, do you have a point to add on the same? Uh, maybe, maybe so can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, Abel will be dropping for a meeting, so uh, okay. hopefully after he's done, he'll be joining us. So okay. yeah, we are left with Madonna. So you have something to add on the same? Can you give me one second? One second. I didn't get you there. Chris? Okay. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Ah, okay, okay, six. Sorry, can you repeat your question? Uh, the question was like, uh, what do you think makes a software engineer uh, or um, a techie? Let me generalize it, start out, especially for getting started. Yeah, that's a very good question. And I feel like um, 
one thing that I can say is that the tech industry right now, as compared to, let's say, 10 years ago, it's pretty different. So 10 years ago, you didn't need to stand out in anything. You just needed to show up, do like an interview, pass the interview and get the job. But right now we have so many people that really are looking for the jobs. And then it really begs the question, like, how do you stand out? So a couple of things that I've noticed because I've interviewed people and I've hired people over my, like, let's say a decade plus career is number one, you need to be able to, and I feel like it's not necessary, but it's good. Like, just have a project. And this is because number one, it really helps showcase that you've been able to come to start something from start to finish. And I normally see many people would come to me and ask me like, hey, look, I don't have an idea. What can I do? Normally, what I say is I don't try to reinvent the wheel all the time. It's okay to pick up on something that you might have wanted to do and do it as your sample project. Now, this project, do you need to launch it to production and have it active? I think that's a very good thing to actually help you stand out because it shows that, hey, I have a project that has uses that, you know, I build upon this project. It helps me learn. Just another way to help you stand out. Like I said, again, it's not necessary, but I feel it really helps. Now, number two, something that really helps you stand out too is just be good at what you do. And I feel like I've said this, I've said this so many times now. I will sound like a broken record, but I think it's very vital, especially during these times, just being good at what you do. Because then again, there's a lot of competition. You don't want to have that opportunity to get that job interview and then you fail. Now, one thing that I always say that it's okay if you fail the job interview. You know why? Because you don't take that failure as a setback. You take that failure as something that really motivates you or fuels you to learn and understand why did you fail what are the things that you can pick up from that interview? How can you be better? So definitely say, yeah, take that, go back, revise, get better at it. Now, lastly, I would say, again, network. I feel like uh, standing out is just networking these days because your next job might come from somebody from your community. So I feel like, um, and like before, like I mentioned when we started, I started being active in a community in 2019, yet I've been, I had been in the software engineering field for a while. It's because I noticed that, hey, I was getting isolated and I needed to meet other people. So I would say definitely now there's a lot of those communities out there. So definitely meet your community, network with them, understand what's happening, and also try speaking. I feel like this is another way to actually stand out because um, speaking really elevates your career in different many ways. Sometimes I've also heard, hey, I'm just a junior. What am I speaking about? You don't have to speak about complex topics. No, you can speak about topics that you're learning or things that you're learning. And it just builds your like interpersonal skills, too, because then you're able to complete a sentence. You're able to showcase and teach others how to, let's say, learn. So, yeah. Those three things are the things that I would say definitely after having interviewed people and hired people too, and just looking at the temperature that we're in right now, those would help. I might be missing others, but that's what I think. Okay, thank you. Back to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, at the end, you tell us more about your company which you talked about, but uh, I'll give Grace a chance to ask you the next question. Uh, but maybe before she asks, I will maybe mention this. Two people have joined. Um, Vincent, he is a DevOps engineer, a senior one. Uh, he works with uh, Gany, if I'm not wrong. Then we have the Encare. It's a startup in US that uh, hires software engineer. I can see the founder or co-founder joined, so they'll tell us more about it. But uh, unless they have anything to add on the same point of starting out, we'll move to the next question, uh, which will be asked by Chris. Chris, you can help me. I, I can add um, something about standing out, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, go on. Sure, thank you so much for the space and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm Karanja Gashusha, I'm the, uh, uh, I'm the founder of Encare. And uh, one of the things that I've experienced in um, even just working on Encare itself, because 
we have uh, worked with uh, developers uh, in Kenya, and uh, we've also been interviewing candidates in Kenya, is uh, one of the biggest things that I learned is that even when people actually have the coding skills, the tech skills, the software engineering skills, um, there's also a real need to be very attentive to the soft skills. Uh, just simple things like meeting etiquette, uh, showing up on time, um, the etiquette of responding to emails, the etiquette of writing uh, clear um, cover letters. It does not need to be long, just very brief, but making sure that it is um, well written. There are no typos because if you're making any errors in your cover letter or in your resume or in your CV, then what you're telling me is that you're not attentive to detail. And in coding, you're looking for people who are very attentive to detail. One of the things that uh, sets us uh, apart from, say, a company like Andela is also that we are not just recruiting software engineers, we are recruiting everyone in the tech ecosystem. Everything from communications, business analysts, project managers, uh, product managers, et cetera, et cetera. For, for roles such as business analysts, project managers, you need people that are very attentive to detail, that know meeting etiquette, not just how to code, that understand the importance of communicating with the C-suite uh, and, and how to do it, that understand um, the, the importance of good writing. So the soft skills and the communication skills, I think, are very overlooked, and not just in Kenya, even here in the United States and other places where I've lived and worked. Um, but they are extremely important, and employers are paying attention to them. Um, and to that, I'll just add one more thing, which is that I, I came into this space myself uh, as somebody who uh, was not really in tech, and I ended up working as a business analyst and project manager. And one of the most important skills that helped me in that role was the fact that I'm a writer, uh, and, and, that's, and writing is my background. And so communication was really the thing that uh, drove the success. Thank you. I'll yield there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. At the end, you tell us if there are opportunities in your company. Do you pay better than the Kenyan startups? Uh, that will answer at the end. Let me give Grace the chance to ask the next question. Grace? Yeah, yeah. I love that Karanja has highlighted that small things are being overlooked. Um, so let's pay more attention to detail. Um, he has already highlighted one thing uh, in the question that you're going to handle next, which is um, typos in CV. That's just a snippet of it. But I'd like I'd love us to talk deeper, um, talk deeper into crafting impressive tech resumes and portfolios. What advice would you give a candidate um, who is looking to effectively showcase their skills and projects in order to stand out to potential employers? I think Madonna can go first. Yeah, I think I'm just going to keep saying these questions are pretty good and because uh, I <laughs> looked at it. And what I can say is that, number one, I think I like the fact that you called out uh, tiny details on resumes because I've seen that issue where people don't pay attention to details. And I feel like um, it actually comes with experience because I feel like when I started my career back in the days, back, back, I wasn't paying too much attention to details. But right now where I am, if you make a tiny mistake, I mean, I'm not going to be hard on you, but I'm just going to be like, you did not pay attention. And I don't like that. It really pisses me off. I'm just being honest. And this is why. If you put so much time into crafting your resume, it really gives the review of your resume that thought of, wow, this person is really, really taking this serious. And how do I know you're taking this serious? Is because like not spelling mistakes or you do not include, let's say, 10 things in one year to showcase the work you've been doing. Now, I've seen a couple of mistakes which I can definitely 
highlight and I think I might be a little bit here generalizing based on what I've seen, but make sure you don't make those mistakes. For instance, if you worked, let's say, for a company for, let's say, three months and then worked for another company, let's say, for three months, and you end up having, like, let's say, five companies that you've worked for shorter terms, I would definitely highlight the most work that you did in bullets, let's say from three, but not post all the five. Just my thoughts though. Go in with the latest. And this is why, because sometimes you might find that because the shorter, because you stayed in those positions for shorter periods of time, it doesn't really matter as much as you just summarizing in higher level what you actually did to give more details. And I've seen that as a mistake that people do without even knowing. Like you just wanna showcase you've done so much, but what was the value in it, right? So ensure every time you write a resume, just highlight the points or your recommendation or good feedback that you got from, let's say, your boss. Make those seen most. Now, the other thing is that there's so many great free software for resumes right, right now. I actually used to use Novo Resume. It's free for one page. And it really helps you highlight, let's say, your skills, your what is it called? Your job, your work history, your education, if you, have, if, you, if you have one. And I would also like to say that when you're writing your resume too, just ensure that you use great bullets and don't use Word. <laughs> I mean, I have nothing against Word, but don't use the Word document because it's, I feel like uh, we are now more modern in this. Again, we're going back to the point of this, a lot of free tools to help your resume stand out. So just utilize them. now. Finally, very, very important, find someone to review your resume. I know most of us sometimes might be stubborn and I liked the etiquette call. Don't be stubborn. Send it to someone, especially in a community, let them review your resume. For instance, I said, some expert, Haron is amazing. Reach out to Haron. He might not be a web developer, but he might be able to know one thing or two about reviewing resume. You can say, hey, Haron, sorry, Haron, if I'm giving you a lot of work. But I can also help review resumes too. You can say, hey, I have my resume. Here is the link to the resume. Let me know what you think. It's always very important, but because you can mislook something that somebody might see and say, hey, maybe you need to edit, edit this here and change this here. So those are tips I might add because I know it's not a one size fits all situation in this particular site because each and every experience is different because we might have somebody that's more experienced that's a different type of resume. And then we might have somebody that's very junior and that's a different types of experience. Now, I've also seen another resume problem and this is just through me hiring and that is, I saw somebody highlight and I think it's okay because I feel like in Kenya people get, and this is something I learned the other day too. Like in Kenya, somebody can do, let's say web development, they can also do mobile development, they can also do Python and that really becomes very difficult for somebody that's trying to hire for a specific role because then I'm like, ha, huh, what experience do you actually have in, let's say, mobile development if I'm looking for a mobile developer because you've done all these things? So niching down can be a big issue, but I totally understand the situation because it's, somebody had to explain that to me because I was so confused. Because here in America, let's say, if I've worked in Android for all these years, it's easier for me to get a job in Android because they'll be like, hey, this person have actually been doing this for many years so they're good at what they're doing so that shouldn't be also like a disadvantage but i would definitely say based on your recent job the one you're really wanting to apply for highlight that more you might add the other ones but say like this is something you worked on but this is what you have as experience to help navigate that that is you're applying to let's say like the U.S. market or any other international market. But I might be wrong in this, but I think that would be the right way based on what I've seen so far. Back to you, Grace. Sorry, is it Grace? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Grace. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. thank you for the detailed um, response. I, I love one thing you have highlighted, find someone to review your resume. I think I'm among the stubborn guys who never do that, but I'm looking into doing that next time. Yeah, yeah so, find a friend. And I think it really is helpful because you might not see something that 
that the person will see like hey because i have a mentor too my ment i mean and this goes to also finding a mentor i feel like in every stage of your career it's always important to have a mentor because they help you in so many ways for instance i have a mentor that checks check checks me like madonna this is not going right and then sometimes she's like yeah you're actually a unicorn company and i'm like oh my god thank you <laughs> so finding a make a, a mentor is very important it helps with so many things like those like reviewing your resume yeah sure all right i, I think abel can go next um on the same on the same um topic oh yeah um uh, i think madonna has said some some nice things to that question um mine is just to add a little bit of what she has said to what she has said um if i, I would go to the the resume part because it's more it's mostly the entry level or the entry point to your job application you can easily fail just from submitting uh, poorly written uh, CV or resume. Um, and as I usually tell most of you people who attracted this, there's no one CV for all the jobs. You need to read through the job and write a CV for it all the time. There's no CV, one CV for all the roles. Um, the reason is the reason is why is, is because most um, ATS uh, apps, that is applicant tracking system, usually look for keywords and uh your previous cv or your current cv may not have the keywords which are, they are looking for and you easily uh don't proceed to the next step beyond uh just past past to submit the cv um as madonna said um uh listing 100 things in your cv uh with no quantity uh, quantity of the work you did is not i don't think it has got any impact uh, for instance, I see people say that uh, develop mobile application for X, Y, Z. What was the impact? Did you increase the website traffic by any percentage? Did you save the company any 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 monies? Indicate that in your CV. Quantify your achievements. It's gonna go a long way. Of course, as I said, keywords. The job description has got keywords. They are looking for front end, React, TypeScript, GraphQL. Uh, React query, uh, Kotlin, all these nice things. They are keywords which are which have been put in the job description. If they are not in your CV, you are clearly failing a lot. Uh, and I I know this is not the most important thing, but proofread your CV a lot for grammatical errors. Grammatical errors scream a lot of unprofessionalism. Curriculum vitae is not curriculum vitae, and people like will like wow, what is this man saying? What is uh, lady saying? Uh, you need to profit for grammatical issues or errors in your CV. Uh, your CV does not need to have tables. Tables don't go through ATS system. Table that is column row uh, based uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, of representing your achievements. Bullet points all, always for the win. And your CV should your CV or your portfolio. Most most companies ask for um, application letter. Tell a story in your application. Let people see what you did. What did you achieve? What were the results? Jan please tell a short journey of your career. And people will clearly see that uh, you have not been stuck on one uh, in one point in your career. Uh, of course, uh, I'll say that we have a couple of tools right now, AI tools, which can help you pass ATS. Uh, there is one called Jobalytics. Jobalytics is a plugin for Joba, Job Analytics. Jobalytics is a plugin for Google Chrome. So what, what you do is you upload your CV to Jobalytics and go to LinkedIn, uh, try and, uh, and uh, apply for a role. It's going to tell you the percentage uh, which your CV uh, matches. So ideally, Jobalytics is going to give you a percent. So if you are below 70%, that means you're not going to pass ATS stages so you need to update your cv again put in the keywords tell a good story and then try again upload the cv to the plugin and then see how you're doing uh we have now professional cv writers in kenya not all of them are good look for one good person who understands tech to help you write your cv it's not free most of the time uh madonna said that we should always have people proofread our cvs and review our cvs 
I'm very poor at that. I'm going to look for people to read my CVs in my, the next round of job application I'm going to be doing in a couple of months. But yeah, th those are my uh, few points on that. Madonna, you got something to add on? I can see your hand is up. Yeah, so I actually have something that came to my mind when Marcella was speaking, and I think this is just uh, vamping up your LinkedIn, your LinkedIn page, and this is why. I feel like um, a lot of things have changed over the years. Like I mentioned, when I started uh, my tech career back in the days, I don't want to age myself so much. We did not need to have like a good LinkedIn profile. No, that was not needed. Just through let's say university you would there was an app that used to be called i think i forgot the name but then you would have recruiters come to your school and then you would get recruited and start your job there it was easy but now with linkedin i feel like there's more opportunities there because there are jobs of course there's again competition but i feel like right now every employer for instance like i mentioned i've interviewed and i'm hired people i definitely check the linkedin account for some reason and everybody here might correct me but i think it's definitely great to revamp your linkedin profile just to stand out in so many ways in um and also the jobs that i had mentioned before like you don't need to list like let's say five jobs that you had like three or less than one year experience working there you can list them all on linkedin just give details and um i don't think my linkedin is perfect but i've heard people rec say that i've listed it nice so i can just share here and then people can look it through but just the way you put let's say your things that you've done your volunteer work really helps a lot and this is for anybody that's new and also established people but also again i like to always mention with caution it's not necessary because not everybody gets a job through LinkedIn. But if you're, let's say, trying to break in right now, I feel like it's also an, it's an added plus. That's what I would call it. So yeah, look into those LinkedIn profiles and revamp them and make them stand out. <laughs> I'm going to share mine on the chat. Oh, and also something else that I've remembered, a portfolio. And you don't have to create a portfolio that's um, that has requires a lot of hosting. I think through GitHub, it's pretty easy, especially for UI UX designers, people who can showcase their work. Also software engineers, because I think for product managers it will be different because I don't think maybe they can showcase like let's say a project they did product managing on. But for software engineers, you can use uh, free tools like GitHub, Mine was pretty easy. I just built it using um, WordPress, so pretty easy. I'm able to afford paying for its hosting, so not everybody might be able to do that. So if you're able to do that to create a simple profile, you don't need to create anything, any new animations. But also, I always tell people that I mentor here, because I'm in this program where I mentor high school students here, and what I say is that, hey, if you can actually build like a website just using some tech stacks that are pretty cool and showcase what you've done. Hey, look, that's your portfolio. It really helps you get a job much easier. And just also, again, being good at what you do. And that's it, Grace. Right. Thank you so much for um, so much input. Hiron, would you love to add something on that? Uh, maybe one point, I don't know if Mansila or Madonna mentioned, but uh, especially if you're in our side of work, quantify what you did. Like uh, if you built this application or an API that was used maybe by three added uh, users, try to quantify that, but don't try about it. So try to be real as much as you can, but if possible, quantify what you've done. Maybe Masila or Madonna can say if it applies also in other positions and also you have two other people who can add something on the same. Yeah, I think I'd said that when I was talking about the quality, when you're writing your resume, definitely make sure you quantify like if you, and also something else that I noticed that many people don't do, but I think it's very important and crucial because again, I've said I've reviewed, it's when I see somebody mentioned that they got a compliment from their manager about something, that's also very important and good because it showcases that you're actually good at what you're doing because I don't think somebody can lie about that. I might be naive, 
but I doubt somebody can just say, hey, my manager said, and it's a lie. <laughs> so those things are very important too. And then again, just saying that I helped scale the app. For instance, in app development, you can say, I helped to reduce the loading time for more login from let's say 90% to, you know, to let's say 10%, just a rough number that I'm giving, just an example. And that really helps because I'll be like, wow, that's pretty interesting and cool. And again, quantifying like what you did. Like I have, let's say, this project on GitHub that has over, um, let's say, 500 forks and uh, these 100 stars. And that also helps a lot. For instance, I can give a short story about something that I also did when I was also learning Android. And that is I, w I created a project on GitHub that was open sourced. And the idea was to get the people, to get people just to, to come learn together and then what I did with that project is that I enabled people from the, around the world to just contribute. And that project got, I think, of a hundred and something forks and a couple of stars. And people told me that they actually used that project to get a job. So I would also recommend if you're new and you're trying to start out too, try to also start the open source project. It really helps a lot. Find people to contribute, be a maintainer, build together and see how that's going to really help it it's really really helpful because you're building your portfolio again like i said it doesn't have, even have to be on a website it can also be just your github profile because as software engineers definitely i'm looking at your github too i'm not gonna lie i need to see the projects you did but this is just me i'm here for maybe myself and others maybe vincent you can add something. Yeah. Um, hi. Um, thank you, Aaron, for uh, inviting me. Um, my name is Vincent, a DevOps engineer at Ngani Labs, and uh, co -fo uh, founder at Adama. And I'm so glad to participate in this conversation, uh, which is so critical um, now that uh, we are looking into the future of tech of employment and job hunt for um, technical candidates. I think it is all uh, very important and uh, resounding uh, based on the, uh, the previous speakers. I think uh, it's so critical to focus 100% on uh, strategies or key uh, uh, concepts, especially in technical terms that uh, would help you uh, build uh, your muscles in uh, algorithms, for instance, and data structures, which are always overlooked. Uh, if you are able to logically solve uh, technical problems, which are difficult um, to the organization, this is on backend and uh, frontend being adaptable and building uh, pro uh, pro projects that uh, you can showcase. So, uh, I think in the recent past, I've seen a trend in uh, uh, hires or when you're doing interviews uh, based on what you can do more than what you are saying you can be able to do. 90% uh, of the churn rate is based on uh, are you able to execute? Like how dynamic are you? Uh, I think developers, most of us, we are so rigid in our technical capabilities. So if I'm JavaScript, I'm in JavaScript. If I'm in uh, AI, I'm in AI. If I'm in this, I mean, this is so good uh, to be a master of one, but I think you being dynamic, especially in the organization that you're working on, is very important. Uh, this will help uh, them on their business goals. Uh, sometimes business change, uh, uh, trends change. We are in the era of AI so much integrations in adaptive learning, I um, think it will be so. Uh, uh, more, to, more to that, um, <clears throat> mastering, uh, leave what AI can do and focus your 90% on logical uh, processes of solving these problems because uh, now uh, we are not competing or with AI or uh, changing anything that is coming from there. The only thing uh, we can do is work along alongside it and adopt good practices that will enable us be as quick and efficient in uh, writing uh, code. So 
yeah, I think um, that would be my contribution to, to that. Uh, unless there is any other question, I'm happy to contribute. Thank you so much. Thank you for the input, Vincent. I'd also love some input from Karanja. Karanja, would you love to top up on that? Sure, I will. Um, there's nothing really that I hate more than the question of resumes, to be honest. I hate resumes. I have a hate-hate relationship with resumes and CVs. I would probably fail on every count that Madonna raised, I personally, so thank God. I'm not on the job market myself. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I will say some of the things that I will, uh, you know, basically uh, everything that everybody said um, is, is on point. The problem with uh, CVs and resumes, particularly in the American marketplace, for me, I think is that it highlights, sorry, I may have cut off there briefly. I went under a bridge. Um, I think it, 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 it really highlights the superficiality of um, the job search, right? Because the, the, the CV is such a bad gauge of somebody's uh, abilities and, and skills. And yet, unfortunately, you know, it's the only way, it's the only introduction, right? It's the, it, it's the entry card. So uh, it's very hard to tell whether a candidate is a good candidate just from having a good uh, CV or resume. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, though, if your resume is bad, you are simply, um, what's the word? You're disqualifying yourself. So it does behoove you to do the necessary legwork of uh, creating a resume that uh, fits um, the bill. I, I thoroughly dislike the keywords and the AI platforms that are doing these resumes because you can spot them sometimes. And oftentimes you'll, you know, on, on some occasion I've had these amazing CVs full of all the right keywords, but when you actually interview the person, um, you know, you find that the skills may not be quite up there. So what I would, for, for me personally, what I'm looking for is somebody who's able to articulate everything that is on the resume. So even if, you, even if you're going to use AI, what I would suggest is craft it by hand yourself and then have the AI um, sort of do the grammatical error checks for you, the, the, the spell checks for you. Um, and spell check is, is, is pretty lousy because it will not catch grammatical errors, right? It, it will not catch there and there and here and here, for example. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping AI is better at that. But, um, and then with regards to, for example, when you've done lots of projects in one year, which um, I think seems to be a real issue that employers um, highlight here in the US, um, you can list them all. And what I have found is that the way to do it is you list them under, so if you are freelancing and you are having three month projects, list them all under freelance, um, you know, wh whether you work, if you worked under your co own company, list your company name and then list the three projects under that or the five projects under that. And then it doesn't look like you did, you know, you, you were moving here and there because, and, and I, I disagree with a lot of what American employers are looking for and demanding because in this day and age, the workplace is that way. A lot of people are working on project basis. So it, it, it's a bit schizophrenic in, in my opinion, but I don't get to make the rules. All I get to do is fill the, the roles. So you do need to sort of meet these impossible requests. And, and, and that's one way that I've done it myself. You know, I have listed projects under, you know, freelancer or under my company name and then list all five of them. And I'm one of those people because most of my uh, career when I worked uh, in the corporate world was on project basis. So there were times when I had two or three projects um, in, in three years um, or even more. Um, what was the other thing? In, in terms of achievements, 
again, this is very superficial. Um, you know, it, 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 they do want you to highlight what you achieved. It's not always very easy to quantify because sometimes your company isn't even going to tell you how much you saved them in dollar uh, amounts because of your project. So it's sort of a superficial request, but then there are things that you can quantify yourself, as a, especially in this in the tech world, because there are ways to measure. Um, you know, for example, reducing time. Uh, I don't know, response rates and stuff like that. So that's things that you should highlight. Uh, they do they do want you to highlight what you achieved, what you accomplished, as opposed to um, I, um, I, I coded for this, that, and the other. You, you want to highlight the actual impact of, of what your coding, your developing job was, um, in as much of a realistic way as possible. Uh, but again, I, 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 I dislike this topic because I, I honestly think that in many ways it highlights the superficiality, particularly of the American workplace. And I've lived, I've done most of my work and, and, and um, schooling in the United States, but I started out in the United Kingdom and I think that it's a very different environment. So that's the other thing too, you do have to tailor. If you're applying for a job in the UK, um, there's slightly different requirements. For a job in the US, it's slightly different requirements. And for example, and I'm still, despite having lived and worked here most of my life, I think I'm still very much a Kenyan man. And so I relate very much to this idea of being multi-skilled and multifaceted. Uh, and I always want to highlight all of those skills, but it seems like in the American marketplace, that is too much uh, information for them to digest. And so if you're applying for a job in the United States, they do want you to highlight those skills that pertain to that particular job. I feel that if you are applying for a job in Europe, the people are a bit more nuanced. They, are, they, they have a bit more bandwidth to sort of uh, absorb a lot of information. And so you can showcase very different types of roles, but then show the common thread in them. And then lastly, the, uh, I'll just reiterate the importance of a portfolio, because even if, for example, you I see your resume and it has typos or mistakes, or it's for whatever reason, it's inadequate. If you have a portfolio to accompany it that allows me to gauge your, your skills in a real way, I will be willing to, um, to what's the word, to uh, overlook some of the uh, tiny errors. Um, and I'll yield there, I'll, I see Madonna has a hand up, so I, I wanna hear from her, thanks. Now, I think what I wanted to add to that point was, the thing that I've seen is that the reason as to why they insist on seeing, let's say, how much time you spent on one thing, it's because there's this uh, consideration of you becoming an expert, which means you have the knowledge. And I think if we move away from tech, for instance, and just go to to the doctor, to like doctors and, um, and medical doctors, that's one career that I really respect a lot because those people spent more than 15 years, I might be wrong, just doing one thing before they can even actually practice. So when you think about it, it's just, it might be annoying, but for some reason it really helps because then I think, and this is also me having done something for so long, for so many years, I've seen the advantages of it. You really become good at it because at the end of the day, you are like, oh, now I know how this these things work. And as compared to before where you were new and you would struggle a lot, it shows that you've actually scaled down and you're way better at what you do now and again like i mentioned i might be wrong in this but this is definitely why the system here really looks forward for that because i've seen like resumes at my jobs my previous jobs and previous jobs are just being turned away based on the fact that somebody did not spend so much time working on that particular thing because they were like we don't think this person is really qualified because they would not know what they're doing because they've not spent so much time. That's just the other side of it that I wanted to share for anybody that's just wondering 
how is how does it really work? Yeah. I just wanted to add that. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that. I think we have touched a lot on um crafting our CVs. And in that in that lane, I'd love us to talk about how to tailor our CVs in order to fit in different types of tech roles. What strategies would you recommend to a candidate who's looking to apply to different types of tech roles? What strategies would you recommend? Abel, you can go first and then we can have Madonna. This is oh my goodness, I'm on another call, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go and answer this question. So uh, some of the things strategies I recommend for those job hunting and how they can fit their applications for many tech roles is um first uh, uh let's let's talk about interviewing. Uh, you need to practice for interviewing. There are guys who offer mock interviews. Uh, I know a couple of them. Uh, so if you can get somebody to mock interview you, basically a mock interview is uh, a simulation of a real interview uh, process where you book for some time and then solve some problems here and there. And then, yeah, they'll give you feedback. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, uh, as we have talked about the CVs and the and the cover letters, you should always tailor them and highlight your skills for that specific role. Uh, and um, uh, I know we all have ambitions to work for many companies. Uh, your understanding of the roles and the company and their culture is going to help you a lot. Uh, with uh, cultural interviews and uh, the questions which are not technical questions. Uh, of course, highlight your relevant projects. I know we have a million of projects in, in GitHub on GitHub to do apps, proper apps. Uh, look for the ones which are relevant, the ones which easily demonstrate your technical skills, your problem-solving abilities, which qualify you for that specific role. If I'm applying, let's say, to work at Google as a senior uh, or principal engineer, I have no business sending my not up, which I did in 2017. Uh, it's not it's not clearly uh, showing my technical skills or my problem solving abilities. Uh, of course, you need to express some passion uh, towards the roles which you are applying for, and also towards the company which you want to work for. I know we are most of us are really looking for the dollar and or any other currency, which is not Kenyan shilling. Uh, but also something else needs to drive your your job application process, and not it's not always money. Uh, you should be able to resonate with what the other company problems the problems which they are trying to solve is are they problems which you want to continue solving? Do you like their tech stack? Do you genuinely have interest working for these companies? It's going to save you a lot of problems or a lot of uh, back and forth when you ask uh, some simple questions, which you may not have. And for software engineers, uh, of course, highlighting your programming skills, your relevant frameworks and languages, and your software development methodologies is going to come in handy. For data, data scientists, people are into data, uh, Emphasis on your analytical skills, your uh, know-how in data analytics tools, and experience in statistical modeling is going to help you too uh, when you are doing your applications. I want to speak for product managers. I don't have a lot of uh, background in that. But if you can show your focus, uh, if you can show your focus on user experience and design skills, uh, how you're good at uh, coming with good products, understanding of market trends, and the ability to uh, come up with features and iterate on them and, and prioritize on them. It's going to help you too uh, while applying for these roles. I think those are some of the things, the strategies which you can employ. Of course, as I keep on telling people, 
don't stop learning. Uh, learning is a continuous journey. And most of the people, whenever they put you to through job uh, application processes, they are not looking for correctness. I remember when I was interviewing for Andela back in 2019, uh, I went through a technical interview and later on when I talked to the interview interviewer, uh, who is now my friend, they told me they were not looking actually for a complete functional uh, solution. They were looking for my thought process. How do I react in the face of bugs? How do how well do I understand the problem solving uh, process for this uh, kind of question? Do I have other alternatives when it comes to what I'm trying to solve? Can I ask questions? Am I audible enough? Am I giving up on this thing? It's going to help you a lot. That was my two cents. I think Back those are pretty guess. good. Oh, sorry. Ah, sorry it's going Madonna. Yeah, yeah, it's Madonna's turn. You can just go on. Yeah, I think what you've said is very good, but I have an issue with one thing. And this is just me as an interviewer, because I really think it's very hard for, for people to just talk through their project. And this is why. I think someone might be very, I mean, some companies have definitely missed out on talent because of that. Because let's say somebody did not think through like what they were building. Honestly speaking, I think I do better when I'm coding when I'm speaking because I like to think by myself. Because this thing of doing, uh, I, I, I think I'm like, oh, I need to do this, I need to do, I'm like, uh, why am I speaking out loud? <laughs> So in it, when it comes to those types of interviews, really, I don't like them. That's why I prefer like to walk through projects. Now, I think it's in every role is different. For instance, I can speak for 100 engineers. If you're interviewing for a position like, let's say, senior 100 engineer, mostly most of the companies that I know here in the United States, they ask you to do a project. And after that project, you can explain like what you did. And then you can add one feature as they're there. And for the feature, I normally, I think it's always good to just be upfront. Because look, not everybody does that. Because it's an interview. You're so nervous. You're, you're trying to, like, this is a job that you really want. And you're like, uh, you definitely do. I'm going to use this word, screw up in so many ways that you did not even anticipate. Now, the only thing that I think when you're tailoring your CV for a particular job market is that I would highly recommend not to lie or use um, AI because I feel like I've seen, I, okay, I've seen this on Twitter and I thought that was a joke where people said they lied about a position and when they got the job, they're like, I don't know how to do this. For instance, I cannot say I'm a, I'm a certified AWS engineer and I don't know how to use AWS. <laughs> So definitely don't lie on your resume. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't lie. Just be authentic. Like, say what you've done. See what you're capable of doing. Now, as for the keywords, I really have an issue with that. I do know it's highly recommended because of these days we have automated systems. And this goes back to the point of finding a community and then using that referral network more as compared to applying for the jobs through the system. Now. I would definitely say back in the days it was easier. And this is funny, but I think applying through Glassdoor, I don't know if anybody here has ever done that, but that really worked pretty well. And applying through just the company's website also works. But if you apply in any other parts, sometimes they filter out and then they just disqualify you immediately because let's say the job was listed and then it has over 10,000 people who applied. I mean, that's a lot. They will not go through all the resumes. So again, I think I'm going to summarize this in this way. If you find a network, it's much easier because then somebody that works there can really easily connect you to the recruiter or even um, uh, recommend you. And then second, I know this is not highly recommended, but sometimes it works. And this is just seeing on your LinkedIn if you have a connection with somebody that works there. For instance, if you're connected to me on LinkedIn, you can check if I'm connected to somebody that works for ABC company that you want to interview with. 
And then if you know me personally, you can ask me, hey, Madonna, can you connect me or can you refer me or can you mention my name to this person that works here? Because I've done that. I've actually done that before where I've reached out to someone for someone else and then they actually ended up getting a job. I don't mean to say it works all the times, but it's a better way of networking because then you get to meet the person. Another way is that I don't know how many people use blind, but this is actually might be specific to the United States because we have an app that's called blind and that's for companies, corporate companies in America. And it's easily for just you to ask for somebody like for a cold referral and they work all the time. Like somebody will reach out to you like, hey, do you want me to refer you to Uber? And they do it. Because if you did not know, many of this referral, many of these companies have a referral bonus. So if I referred you and you got hired, I get some cash, some dollars. <laughs> so I think to me, I would really highlight going that route of networking with people, connecting with people, instead of coldly just sending your resume and never getting to hear back. I know sometimes, I know it's it's also tricky, but I think I would want to say I've seen it work. And I also like to mention sometimes I might be wrong in something because I am never, I am not like an expert in everything. I don't know everything, but I think that can be a good way to get a job or to, to help yourself stand out and your resume be seen faster as compared to just finding, let's say, an AI tool that does all the rewriting and then just submitting everything for you. Back to you, Grace. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madonna, for that. Uh, maybe I can ask this question. Uh, it's a broad one, and different opinions are welcomed. Uh, I want to know, like, the what are the specific challenges that are there, especially for those looking for opportunities, uh, both locally, and mostly the global remote opportunities. So what are the advantages? And um, apart from the money, of course, being paid by dollar or euro, or what are the advantages and ch specific challenges that are there? We can start with you, Madonna, maybe when you come yeah, on. I have a yeah, is that for job seekers or for people who are in the job? I think I didn't get the question. Uh, specific advantages and disadvantages for people seeking opportunities, uh, especially in the global market. Yeah, I think the most uh, disadvantage I can say definitely for people seeking international opportunities is the visa, the visa issue because definitely that's pretty hard. For instance, um, you might find a very good job and then you're disqualified because let's say you're not from here. Oh, when I try to think of another disadvantage might be the thing I'd mentioned earlier, which is uh, the pay party, right? you might be paid less as compared to somebody that works here. For instance, I live in New York, and if you were, let's say, even right now, there's a big debate that somebody living in New York cannot be paid as somebody living in New Orleans. So that's another disadvantage that I see. Another disadvantage that I see definitely is the time difference. That's a very big thing. For instance, in Nairobi, you might be actually working extra hours because let's say by the time you're going to bed is when your team is waking up here. And I think this also goes to, I think Berlin, when I was in Berlin, I think the time difference there with Kenya was not that bad. So I don't think that will be a very big issue. I think London too might not be that terrible as compared to the US, for instance. So the time difference here is very big and that will be a very big disadvantage. Because sometimes you might want to sleep and then you're like called in on a meeting or maybe you submitted a PR and then you start seeing comments on your PR at midnight and you're like, oh my goodness, what do I do? Do I need to wake up and address all this? So there's so many disadvantages can lead to you having like a stressful life. Now, a couple of advantages, definitely the money, it's going to be different because I don't think, I may be wrong though, but because I've not worked in the Kenyan market, but I think 
um, as a techie in Kenya, you might get paid more when you work for companies that are international as compared to Kenya. And then the other advantage is that you are really exposed to a big wild network, which means you can easily get your next job anywhere because you can showcase that actually I worked for a company based out in the, in the city, like let's say New York or San Francisco or another city, and then it's going to be easier for you to get another job. So I hope I answered that question correctly, but that's how I understood it. <laughs> Harun, is that the right way? <laughs> yeah, actually, that's what we, uh, uh, I expected. Yeah, you got the question right. Maybe we okay, can... thanks. I was like doubting you... myself here. <laughs> uh, no, actually, right. Uh, maybe the same question to Karanja, and tell us if you have open opportunities for people in Kenya and where they can see those opportunities. Karanja? Sure. Um, yes. So one of the biggest advantages, sorry, disadvantages, um, uh, excuse me, that I actually have uh, noticed or experienced is the simple fact that um, there are so many um, Kenyan developers, people who have the skills, but simply haven't had the opportunities to uh, exercise those skills, uh, simply because there, there just isn't that much uh, in the way of... Um, De developer roles, uh, developing, you know, for, for you know, it, it, I, I, and I'm confused about this because there's a lot of big Kenyan companies and I, and I just wonder, is it that they are hiring talent from outside of Kenya? Uh, because there are so many people with really good skills, with, you know, data engineers, developers, software engineers, you name it. But... Um, when you see their resumes, oftentimes they've, you know, they've been doing networking, you know, and, and, and other such jobs that aren't necessarily direct, directly related to, um, to, to, to their, you know, to their computer engineering degrees. And so that becomes a, a massive disadvantage because then when they come into a role, a corporate role, where they're supposed to exercise their, their actual software engineering skills, um, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, of, of, of the soft skills of being a software engineer that, uh, that, that you're going to miss. The other big disadvantage is culture. Uh, every country, and not only just every country, but even every company, has a corporate culture and 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 also every industry has a corporate culture if you haven't been exposed to it, it it really does take a while to get used to one of the biggest cultural differences that i witnessed and i actually witnessed this myself as a result of my own journey through it was um you know being educated in kenya there's this tendency to have this approach to education, authority, the workplace, as, um, as if you're supposed to always know everything about the job, the role, the field that you're in. And I, I, I really um, had great difficulty myself uh, when I started, particularly when I was doing jobs that I was not terribly familiar with uh, or, and, and learning new skills, it did not occur to me that it was okay to say, I don't know. And, and I see that now because I see it even with my own employees um, and, and, and my own, you know, and, and the people that I'm recruiting is that there's a tendency to want to know everything, to, to want to be able to answer in the positive to every question. And what I found about the United States, and I think this, I think this really is quite special to the United States, is there's a certain ease with which Americans say, oh, I don't know, I have no clue. I, I think Americans are really, I mean, Americans are special in this because I do think that there's a tendency to say, oh, I have no clue, with, with such glee 
that, uh, you know, I, I've never seen people that are prouder to not know stuff and, and, and happier and easier with it. Um, and, and, and so it's, you know, that's a little bit of the American uh, workspace. So it's okay to not know everything. And it's very much okay to say, I don't know. But then the answer should not just stop at, I don't know. The answer should be, I don't know. I will research on it very positively and very assertively that I will research on it. I will find out. I will ask. Um, and that was just something that I didn't know myself. It took me many, many years of working in, in, in the corporate environment. It wasn't until I started being in senior level meetings and being in, in, in conferences and, and, and hearing senior level people saying, oh, I don't know, but uh, such and such might know, uh, let's ask them, or I don't know, I'll reach out to such and such, or I don't know, I will have to do some research and get back to you. And, and maybe, you know, maybe it's just me, I don't know if it's a common thing that people have witnessed, but I, I honestly feel like it's, it's, a, it's a definite cultural thing. And so there is a certain you have a massive disadvantage because you're just not going to learn culture from reading about it or watching it on online or on TV or, or, or however much research you do. You're just going to have to experience it for yourself a little bit. But um, I think what uh, I always like to have solutions. It's not just about uh, the, the, the problems, right? So I think what I would recommend is just doing a little bit of research, um, use as much as you can the resources that are available. And thank God that we now live, you know, there are disadvantages and advantages, of course. And, and the fact that we now live in a global village means that you have access to uh, the same media platforms as everyone else. So, that, you know, that can allow you to do some research for yourself. So culture and then just simple experience in, in your field. Those are massive, massive disadvantages that I've experienced that, that are facing Kenyans. And I think the, the, the solutions really for that, in addition to the research, is just more of us Kenyans uh, being founders and building our own companies. I want to see a Kenyan Oracle, a Kenyan um, uh, uh, Salesforce, a Kenyan you know Google, a Kenyan AWS, and, this is a story for a whole nother day, another topic for another day, and I hope that we can have this discussion uh, because I am in touch with Kenyan uh, VC uh, venture capitalists who are looking to be able to uh, um, um, invest in Kenyan uh, startups and Kenyan founders. Uh, but some of the same issues that we are discussing about the disadvantages still abound, even for them. Uh, the, v the VC that I'm talking about, he's you know um, Kenyan born, but American raised and American in every sort of way because he's lived here much, you know, from childhood. And he told me that he struggled to find uh, founders to fund. So it, this goes beyond even just the actual uh, workplace. Thank you. I yield there. Uh, Vincent, you can add something on the same. Uh, yeah, uh, and I agree 100% with uh, Nkare, uh, which uh, means water in my local diaspora. Um, <laughs> So I have, I have had the experience working with uh, developers from India, especially when I was early in my career. And it was so difficult because I started from uh, a product management uh, uh, role, which was heavy because the team that I was handling, it was around uh, 200 developers, Indian developers, and a, a few from uh, Kenya. So the difference that I saw uh, there was a uh, difference in ideologies, approach to uh, work, especially tasks, um, etiquette, uh, small things like etiquette and all the differences. Um, and yeah, time uh, is also, was also very difficult because uh, working on UTC, we just had to uh, adjust to a common time that everyone would be available. Um, so standardizing that also is so difficult because it's night here, it's a day time there, sometimes um, deliverables, clients are sparsely, especially working in a studio. However, if uh, it's a product-based uh, 
organization or company, it's so easy to work with cross uh, teams, uh, especially on development, uh, because you can always leave uh, a comment or uh, notes on where the other person will pick up. But for a studio, it's so chaotic and it can, yeah, it can crumble almost everything. Outside culture, uh, I think that uh, those will be uh, key elements to look at uh, for. But yeah, it's a really good experience working on different time zones, working on um, with different people, mind thought, uh, mind uh, thought processes. It builds your confidence. Uh, you are, you learn a lot. Uh, you are able to know that other people think almost like you. Um, yeah, and it's a good challenge. Thank you so much, Harry. I mean, before Grace asks this next question, I will just drop this question. I will just throw this question out there, and I want to say this. Um, I stand to be corrected. But uh, do you think there are some laws or jobs that are more employable than others? Why am I saying this? I have several friends. Uh, some are in data, others are in mobile application development, others are in web application. Okay, I don't want to be biased, but I want to be logical and we are uh, I'll ask the speakers to share more about it. So do you think like some laws are more employable? Why am I saying this? I know several brilliant hardware engineers who have been in the industry for like, let's say three years. And currently they have stayed for two years now without a job. Similarly, I know someone in data who didn't have a job or loss in campus two years ago. They started working hard last year and they're in a good job. Uh, is it to say that some jobs have those chances of getting the, a job hardly, or there is something that people are doing wrong? Maybe you can start with Madonna or Abel on that. So, sorry, uh, before Madonna goes, I think I can go first and then drop off. Uh, I have a, a, a meeting. But I think uh, it all narrows down to communicating uh, your skills. If uh, you're not able to communicate your skills, then uh, no one will, you will not be visible. So you have to be visible with your technical skills, learn a few uh, communication skills, know how to sell yourself. It is not enough just to know how to uh, create a uh, great Android application. It goes down to knowing how to communicate your greatness in creating the Android applications. So that's why you'll find one who is vocal and can communicate their little skills, even if they are so minimal, uh, people will trust them rather than uh, someone who is not able to communicate uh, their skills. So on top of your hardcore technical skills, uh, engineers, kindly work on your soft skills uh, sell yourself here and there and i think it will take you a long way thank you so much have a great evening uh thank you vincent for dropping in uh we appreciate your time on that i also heard that interviewing is um it, like people should prepare for interviewing like the way they prepare for skills uh Haber, madonna or one can go first I'll, I'll, I'll go last i'm still on a call Okay, Madonna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think um to be fair, it sometimes it might be the job market, but I think I like what Vincent said about having the soft skills. Because I think in the same perspective, Harun, I've seen other amazing Kenyans who get a job and then end up I mean, I have seen I mean I might be wrong on this because I'm not in the market of Kenya, but I've seen Kenyans who are Android engineers get different roles in like within years, right? So I think you've also seen that. So sometimes it might be how good are how good are you at showcasing your skills, right? And also sometimes it might be how good are you at soft skills? Because sometimes you might be good at also 
technical skills but also if you're not good at the other skills people might be like hi i don't think this person is hireable which is a bad thing to say but as somebody who interviews it might it really comes because when you get interviewed for instance i write a note about hey this person i think they were good at technical they answered my questions this way right and i liked the way they said so we have to give like a summary like five points five bullet points of why we think that person is not a good fit or why we think that person is a good fit now i have to say especially in the american market sometimes it might be luck oh also some i mean i'm skeptical did you hear my side there <laughs> i'm skeptical but luck can also play a role however i always say bring yourself very ready by ready, I mean, don't just prepare only on the technical interview. Just get ready with the behavioral questions because people get asked those questions too. Like, I don't ask them myself. For instance, I don't ask this question of where do you see yourself in five years? Because, I mean, come on, that's not very realistic if you ask me. I would rather ask a question like, hey, tell me of a time where you experienced an issue when you're working where you are. And how you handled it, right? Because to me, why do I think that question is important? It's important for to, to measure the behavior in this way. This person will explain how they went through a conflict if there was one, how they navigated the conflict at work if there was one, and how they reacted to it. And that really tells you a lot about that particular person and how they work, because you don't want to hire a person and everybody in your team team quits. Is that what you want to do? No. So definitely always, and this goes to people who interview, ask those kinds of questions, like especially conflict handling, because software, the field of software can be very demanding. And also the other thing that I always say is that in every job, and I know this might be very, very hard, but always assume positive intent. What do I mean by that? If somebody asks you a question or if you submit a, a PR and somebody leaves you a comment, sometimes it can be annoying, but view it as positive intent first and you don't end up getting your feelings hurt because having worked in this industry for now, I would say over 13 years, <laughs> you can get annoyed for a fact because people will think you don't know what you're doing and other people will be like, this is not the best way you can do this but stand your ground like show why you wanted to do that i'm hoping i'm not mumbling but i think that's what i would definitely do myself and i hope i answered that question Hara. yeah sure oh uh, karanja sure um yes definitely there are some roles that are more in demand I think personally, I've actually been surprised by how many software engineers there are. It does seem like everybody that's heard of tech has gone to uh, development engineering. So everyone's learned how to code, but there are so many other jobs, particularly the ones that are tech adjacent that are just um, as in fact, more in demand uh, and sometimes require less technical skills. So for example, business analysts are highly in demand. Like you really, really need people. Uh, the industry needs people who can translate requirements from the business to the technology. And those are business analysts, the people who write your business requirements, your functional requirements, product managers, project managers. And the thing, uh, the beauty of these roles is that they are very versatile. You can take a business and your business analyst experience from banking to Google to Apple to uh, Ford to uh, you name it in every industry to construction and project management as well. Uh, and so uh, if you're in tech, you need to be willing to explore these other roles. And and this also goes to the question you asked earlier about tailoring your resume to what to uh, for jobs, which is you don't always necessarily need to uh, necessarily just write so much about the experience you've had as well, 
not purely just the experience you've had, but you can also tailor your resume to the next role that you want. For example, I've hired somebody recently to do communications, but their background is in um, uh, programming, right? But they have a real interest in communications and um, and and in you know and that type of stuff, uh, community management and what have you. So there are so many skills that are tech and tech adjacent that are not necessarily just software engineering, data, data analytics, data engineers, data scientists these are in high demand and so if you know if if you already know how to code if you already know python then it's a very easy transition to becoming a data scientist or a data analyst or a data um, engineer and so um, there does need to be some versatility such that the only thing you can do isn't just coding uh, because you know it's very specific um, but it's also, it can limit you. And so, yes, there are roles that are more in demand. And in my view, it's business analysts, it's uh, product managers, it's project managers, and, um, you know, scrum masters, you know. And, and I think these days it appears people want people who have experience in the agile uh, environment. And so, you know, those skills are important. And then, you know, learning tools like Jira and, um, you know, those, those document management tools that uh, a lot of corporations use. So, you know, that will help you even if you're just, even if you're a software engineer and what you're interested in is software engineering, you know, learn those other tools and frameworks and, and platforms that will enhance and, and make you stand out. Um, I do have to run, um, but you had asked if we are hiring. Yes, we are. And Kare is hiring uh, people in the whole tech ecosystem from communications through to data analysts, data engineers, software engineers, um, um, product managers, soft, you know, software developers, as well as business analysts project managers, uh, product managers, all of those roles um, that are in, in the tech and tech adjacent world. So do please uh, visit us and, and register. Um, I am a co-founder, uh, I'm, I'm a founder and co-founder of a couple of other businesses. And for example, Briefscoop, which is one of my other um, uh, companies, uh, is a news and media site. And we are looking for a Web3 writer. So, um, you know, do reach out to me. There are, there are several roles um, that we are hiring for. Um, both in Ankari as well as uh, in Briefscoop, like I said, a Web3 writer, um, as well as in another Web3 uh, um, company that I'm a recent co-founder of called uh, Black Panther, which is a Web3, a straight Web3 crypto project. And I actually do have to drop off because we are having a space and ask me anything space uh, on that in the next uh, four minutes. So thank you so much for having me and uh, look forward to uh, communicating and communing with you guys further and holding more spaces like these with you. I, it's, this is really needed and I appreciate it. And there's so many topics that uh, can be covered uh, in the tech space. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Karanja. Uh, thank you. Also, uh, you can share maybe the links where people can get in touch with you in the chat so that they can apply and also get in touch with you. Also, I would say like we have a data specific hackathon on 17th this month uh, where people will be building a uh, little uh, like world projects uh, we have several so if your team has several in mind that they want to be done you can share so that we can have them uh, if you're interested going as a participant also <coughs> uh, check the lux uh, webs uh, uh, twitter page you'll get the url uh, remember the ticket sales hands on fifth uh, on fifth that is Monday next week. So we're expecting to see you. We have several people. We are like, uh, we have few spaces remaining or few spots remaining. So if you have the chance and you'll be free that day, come. If you have project that can be built also, share. If you're looking for talent also, come and interact with them. Everyone is welcomed. So Grace, you can go on. Yeah, I love that people are dropping their portfolios 
in the comments keep on doing that um you never know who is going to come across your portfolio now there's something we've mentioned concurrently um all through this discussion and that is networking i believe everyone would love to network effectively and build effective networks bearing the fact that it's your net worth so i'd love us to talk about the tips on networking effectively um i'll give madonna the honors of going first because i believe she has mentioned it the most so madonna you can go first yeah i think i also have a hard stuff i had stop in a few minutes but definitely i would say networking is very very crucial especially in this day and age because i mean think about it ah unlike before where people would walk or oh, let's say submit their resumes just through portals and then get a call back it's getting harder and harder now to do that like just submit your resume and then get a call back so i would highly recommend people networking with other people like going to those take events going to those hackathon knowing what's happening around you now i've also seen i think and i heard this before we started the space where somebody said don't trust i think it was masila he said don't trust the people that sell you the idea of um let me teach you how to code in two days i really think that's false because there's no way anybody is going to teach you how to code in two days now another thing that i wanted to mention too in this is that just know why you really want to go to coding i think for people that got into software back in the days they really knew why they wanted to do it for instance i know why i wanted to do it i never thought it was about the money to me it was not about the money it was because first of all i liked planes i wanted to become an aeronautical engineer i couldn't be one because i learned about laptops and i was fascinated by laptops so i wanted to build something like a laptop and then i got a phone and i was like what is this phone what is this snake game why can't i be the one to build something like that that's how i ended up in software and studying software engineering so definitely i think understanding the why is very important and it helps you narrow down to even why you're in tech but if you're going it for the money also it's okay people are different if they just like hey i think this is the thing that pays me much now i want to do it i have no problem from that so i'm going again back to the topic so definitely ensure you network with the people know your why because it's important then because that's what's going to help you stay in the job that you want and it's I, i think to me i always love a good pivot there's nothing wrong with pivoting I feel like my career has always been linear and that has helped me in so many ways for instance now I'm an expert and that means I get insider information I get paid for so many things that are you know I get I have so many advantages for instance I've spoken to over 30 plus events and all those events they're worldwide and some here locally to me and I've never paid for anything I've never paid for the hotel or the flights because somebody's got me <laughs> because I'm an expert so I'll definitely say know your why know your community network and find your next role and then again uh I know this might um again I think I might sound like a broken record here but you have to know why you also want to be in tech like I think the guy that just left mentioned I think I forgot his name I'm very terrible in names by the way. That's a funny fact about me. But he said about you know like these other jobs that are there like that I take adjacent, I definitely say it's okay to do those. But me being American and I've seen the notion that it's very tough for people even in software engineering. I don't think I wanted to change because I really liked to do what I do. I love coding. So that has to be the thing to do like coding yourself i love coding up to now i still code like every day and i i enjoy it so i think you have to enjoy what you're doing to be able to stay in that particular field but if you don't there's other things also that i intend that you can do and that's also okay too i'm never like the person who blocks ways for others i'm always like hey let's create opportunity for everybody there's nothing wrong with that as long as people are passionate 
So finally, Grace, I think definitely networking is important because it will help you get the next job, get you grow, uh, get you to grow your career, get you to get opportunities, for instance, of learning how you can become an expert in your field. And at the end of the day, what is the end goal? You know, the end goal is either to one day become a CTO or a principal engineer or a distinguished engineer or maybe a founder. So based on what your goal is, just know why you're networking. That's what I would say. It's actually a broad question, but that's my thought on it. Thank you for that. Uh, now that you're an expert in the field, what advice would you give to individuals who are starting in their journey in tech? And are there specific resources or communities you would recommend them to join? That is for beginners. Yeah, I would say don't rush the process. For some reason, I mean, I might sound like I'm gatekeeping here, but I'm not. But don't rush the process. Take your time to understand the stuff. Take the time to understand your craft. And this is based on experience. If you know one thing very well, trust me, going to build something else. For instance, let's say you've been doing Kotlin for so many years and then you move from Kotlin to now do TypeScript or let's say Python, things become very easy. And do you know why? Because all these languages are so similar, just the syntax is different. For instance, the logic is going to be the same. For instance, when I started doing Java, I coded with Java for five years. I started with C actually, and after C, I went to C++. I didn't like C++, so I ended up in Java, built with Java, and now I do Kotlin. But right now, I can wrote, I can write code, I can write TypeScript, I can write Swift, I can write Python when I'm called upon to like solve a Python problem. So at the end of the day, once you understand something very well, and that's what even makes you an expert, it becomes easier for you to understand others. So if you're a beginner, don't rush the process. Spend your time trying to understand things. Now, I have to also acknowledge that I've seen quite smart people that really captured things pretty quickly, and that's very good, but that doesn't still mean that you're an expert. You will encounter issues that definitely that you you might not have, like, experienced before and they all take time to solve now what makes you actually an expert is more spent like you spend more many years doing the same thing like i mentioned i think i gave the example of a doctor they have such a delicate job but they're so good at it because they spend so many years trying to be good at what they do and you notice in doctors they specialize for instance you'll find an ear doctor like a colonoscopy and then an eye doctor like and this is just in the United States. I think it might be very misleading in Kenya because that doctor might know everything in Kenya. But here in the United States, they specialize. And that's why when you're sent to a specialist, they know what they're doing. And those are like the experts of, of the field. So to me, I feel like that kind of end goal for beginners is very good because you know that you're building yourself towards being good at what you do. And I feel like this is this has been me throughout this space because I feel like it's very valuable now after doing it for so long because I've seen people that come up and say oh now I'm an expert in this I don't have any problem with that you know again like I said I'm not a gatekeeper but I see that and I wonder I feel like that's a bit misleading because you cannot lie to people that they will learn how to code in two days it doesn't work like that it definitely does take time and it's worth it to just go slowly and take your time and enjoy the process too. There's a lot to learn. Wow, I love that. Don't rush the process. Um, it's worth um, taking your time to understand everything before you move to something else. Um, Harun, Harun, do you have something to add on that? Uh, no, I can see Haberius back. Uh, Jomo was in table to join. Uh, Madonna, maybe one more question. Uh, so I think Jomo is eating meat. I just saw his tweet. I'm like, I'm going to text him. Like, why are you eating meat when you on this space? <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Uh, the other question that I had for you, Madonna, was like, uh, anything that you feel you should say like any advice that you have, maybe any disclaimer you have. Also tell us about your startup and your book. 
yeah so i can i can talk about my book first so my book was um so the reason as to why i wrote the book was because when i started building mobile apps around 20 i think that's around 2012 2013 the, the structure of building mobile application was not good we had a pattern of using mvc that is model view controller and we didn't have any fragments we didn't have any clean architecture so for me to see how the android ecosystem has really advanced over the years it was just me appreciating that process so the book just highlights about how Jetpack Compose now makes everything easier for newer developers because when we were developing back in the days, it was pretty tough. We just had a couple of activities that you needed to build and then all those activities tied to other activities. But now we have fragments. Now, actually, we have Compose views. So it's amazing. So that's what really inspired me to write the book. So the book is out on Amazon. You can get, I think, a Kindle version or a hard copy version. And um, it's been super fun and I'm actually might be working on a second edition, which is super cool. Now, as for my startup, the reason as to why I decided to go that route or do that particular project is because I'm really passionate about what I do. And I saw a niche and I saw a problem that I needed to solve. And I thought, I'm hoping I'm not solving this problem but for myself. So what I did is I created a sample website first to collect interest. That's what you would do normally. And then I got a couple of interests and I'm super excited. So what my company's name is called Jibu Labs. And the reason is why I went to the Swahili name is because I wanted to create that curiosity in people's mind. Like what does Jibu actually means, which just means answer. So Jibu Labs is a consulting firm that has a flagship product called Jenga Realty. And Jenga Realty is just a platform for real estate. And the idea is to create that place, one-stop shop, where people can easily find long-time stays in Kenya and Africa, not just Kenya. My target is entire Africa. And also I plan on making it bigger and just also targeting the U.S. too and other markets. But the idea is you can rent out short-time stays and long-time stays and also working with the banks, let's say, for instance, in Kenya or other affiliates that have already signed in Ghana and Rwanda, we can easily let people who live here buy properties too. So we have two products in Jenga Realty. That is the buying portion of it and the renting portion of it. So it's a super interesting project. So Harun, there you are. I answered your question. <laughs> So it's pretty interesting. And if you want to follow up, if you want to follow up what we're doing, you can just follow behindergibulabs.com or follow us on LinkedIn. We will be posting any job open job openings there. We did advertise for a Flask developer role, but so far I think I looked with my team and we didn't. We've not seen yet a strong resume on the Flask development. So if you're a Flask developer, please feel free to apply. Harun, that's what yeah. we do. Thank you. Maybe anything that you feel you should have said, maybe advice or something. I don't want to hand the copy before you do that. Uh, what advice do I have? I think I would definitely say um, be kind to others. I know it's funny, but it's pretty good to be kind to others if you're working as a team and this is why sometimes you never know what people are going through especially at this at the jobs and when you're reviewing people's prs or when you're sending feedback sometimes don't have harsh feedback just send good feed not send good feedback just send something that's clear don't be vague because i think that really helps you and helps your colleague and the reason why i said that is because the title says how to get a tech job in this economy. <laughs> so you can tell the economy is pretty tough. So being kind is pretty good. I think I was in Singapore the other day, I think like just last week. And I made an amazing lady from Kenya. I think she she runs Lax Tech too. And she was pretty cool. So I would say definitely there's super cool things happening around Kenya. So definitely stay connected to the community. Know how they're finding those opportunities and tap into that. That's pretty cool. Oh yeah. Uh, Daisy so be kind. <laughs> yeah. Daisy told me that you met 
uh, that was there. Yeah. Last yes, three. I met her in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Anything else uh, for you, Dan? I would say it was fun hanging out with you all. I definitely please feel free to follow us on uh, LinkedIn Jibu Labs. I can also share that. I think if we have any job openings. And also we are on Twitter and Instagram. And what else? I'm super excited to, I was planning to visit, to travel this year. But I think I have a couple of obligations here that I might not travel this year. Because I feel like last year I traveled a lot. But definitely, if anybody has any question, feel free to ping me. I did see a question that I wanted to actually ask you, Harun. I think I saw it on my DM. And the question was, do you have any, because it was asked to me, but I don't think I have any. But the question was, do you have any existing groups for mentorships and upcoming opportunities? So I was wondering if you have one, you can definitely share for the people so that they can join the group especially the mentorship one. I think I got so many questions on that. Yeah, maybe it once at that. There is someone called John in the call, John Bugwa and Grace. If you DM them or the Lux account, you'll be given links to different WhatsApp and uh, Slack channel, especially on Slack channel, you'll get like a, a group where John and Grace and Daisy also shares a lot about the opportunities and the mentorship opportunities that are there. They're basically the people who learn the community. Um, thank you so much for creating time. It was a pleasure having you and hosting you. Um, thank you. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, thank you too. I think I have one last plug. I think it's this year is decided to be more serious on, on YouTube, just uploading stuff on mobile development. So if anybody wants to learn some mobile development, which is pretty cool because you can do it for yourself too and build some cool apps. I am on YouTube too. Just a plug. Oh, and for all the ladies, I have a podcast, Tech Talks with Madonna, where I interview women in tech from around the world. It's super fun. And that's yeah. it. <laughs> now you can share links uh, in the chat so that people can see. Also, people can interact and network in the chat. It's open. Uh, maybe one more thing to say about the Akadon that we have. The tickets are almost done. Uh, we are done selling the tickets. So we are almost done selling the tickets. So you can lash if you don't want to miss. Uh, maybe to give a scope of what it will be. Uh, the venue was communicated. It's at CPA Center, which is along the car road, somewhere where they could drive in. Uh, so that is where you'll be using. You'll be using Helix Center, uh, which is uh, maybe if you was um you receive the what are the newsletter from Helix, they will have it or already they have done, uh, they have shared it. Maybe about the project that will be going on, I may be to say this so that everyone can know. Uh, we'll be having projects that are real life. So for example, we'll be scrubbing data for the houses that are there. Then we will be supporting you to build like a project where you can list all the houses that are there and people can flag, which comes as a, you can build a model that can flag if it's a, a flood or maybe not collect information or if the house is not available. It's like building as a, one start point where you can get all the information that you need. So yeah, basically looking forward to having you. The other one includes like analyzing the YouTube channels in Kenya using YouTube APIs. We'll also have like some simple project where people will be helping you to spin up simple Flask and Python project, which also includes like building a engine that can get all the products that are there in e-commerce website depending on the website um, that are on, um, what do we call it? That are on offer. Also, you also be able to classify a different plugs or sellers in those platforms, depending on the number of stars and the review that people are giving. Uh, other project will be including building data portal for agriculture and much more. So it's a blood, a cardon, that mainly focuses on data. Uh, 
Uh, before I give Habe a chance to say uh, final remarks and maybe her advice, I can see Madonna hands is up so she can say. Oh, no, I actually wanted to ask you a, go a good question that I heard you mention that people can actually scrub uh, the real estate data in Nairobi. Is that true? Uh, yeah, there are different websites. Uh, as soon as I have done it. Okay, maybe we should talk because I would like for you to share with me their site. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We can side chat about that. Yeah, Haber, hi, you're back. Yes, yes, I'm back. So you can start with the question on the advice. Which advice do you have to someone who is getting started and a fresh beginner? Uh, okay. Yeah, that is the most important question that we have done. And like, what recommendation would you be having for someone who is getting started? I, I did join in when Madonna was speaking and she did say some nice things about that. I would, I would add a couple of things uh, to that. Uh, if you're starting and you're making some progress, don't forget to celebrate your progress uh, in whatever way. I see people do that on Twitter uh, and some recruiters are always looking at your at your tweets and probably they see you as a candidate. So celebrating could be you saying what you have built, let people enjoy what you have built in whatever platforms you are comfortable with, social or professional. Uh, learning takes a lot of time and effort and acknowledging that you have uh, beat some milestones, big or small, will keep, keep you motivated and you will avoid burnout quite a lot. Uh, of course, um, I know it's not quite easy to be consistent and you always looking for people to keep you accountable, but that should come within, from within most of the time. Uh, don't wait for your mentors or your seniors to keep on asking you where you are at with your learning, where, what are the problems you have with your project, the challenge which you, which you have. Uh, be consistent with what you are doing. Of course, don't forget to build your portfolios. Uh, I know that's almost cliche now. Uh, portfolios help you practice as kids which you are learning. Uh, your programming languages, the frameworks of choice, the libraries of choice. You, you can easily showcase what you have been learning. You have been learning Angular, Next.js, Next, React, and just whatever you're learning. Putting that in a portfolio is so easy for people to know that the stage with you at the development. Um, of course, uh, learning how to learn is quite important. And different people have got different styles of learning. Uh, like some like online tutorials, some like books, some like boot camps, some like, go to, like to go to campus and learn. Finding what works for you is going to help you cut a lot of time, uh, cut off a lot of learning time. Uh, as for me, I did like watching videos. I'm an old person. I used to watch Bucky Robots back in 2013, 2012, running, learning Java and C++ and whatnot. That worked for me. I know a couple of guys who like books, will find them buying C++ books, C Sharp, uh, JavaScript books, and they will stick to the reading bit. So if that's you, find that. Take notes. Writing has got lots of power and impact to you, to your career. Whatever you write down, I think it's going to stick in your mind a little bit more. And don't be afraid to speak. Madonna did, did talk to this a little bit uh, or into depth. Uh, um, you don't need to have a lot of depth in, in a specific topic or uh, technology to be able to speak about it. The little you know, you can always come and tell people. Not everybody knows, know, know, knows what you know. Uh, confidence, fighting stage fright, and all that stuff comes from practicing. So... That, that's all I'd say. Uh, of course, don't ignore your uh, data structures. They are quite important when it comes to interviewing. Not so many companies would hire you without taking you through data structures. Uh, and uh, some companies would actually overlook that and just take you to give you a take home assignment. But you can't, you can't, you can't always uh, know. So you being ready, practicing lead code and, and code wars and doing all that magic, uh, it's going to help you uh, to ace your interviews. I know most of us 
I like would like to work for big companies like Google, which is you know in Kenya, AWS. They don't joke when it comes to their interview process, so you can't cut shortcuts there. Uh, whenever you can, uh, uh, please document what you are learning uh, somewhere. I know of a person who kept on doing that on Twitter and they got a role. Uh, you may be the next lucky person like that. Back to you, Aaron. Uh, thank you. Um, anything else that you feel like you left out? Um, I don't know. I'm open to doing mock interviews to people. So if you are into front end, uh, mobile space, mostly React Native and iOS, and back end, uh, in Python or Node, you can always ping me. We can, can take you through a mock interview session. Uh, uh, I would also encourage people who are given take-home assignments uh, in your interview processes to take them seriously. Imagine a pool of 15 engineers given the same challenge to build on, and to us it's just a small app on GitHub. You have not even done the best you could have done. No test. No, you're not following uh, any coding patterns, any programming patterns, paradigms, and all that stuff. So when you're given a time assignment, I know intermediate engineers overlook this a lot. Like, yes, I can build a nice React application, but whenever given, when I'm whenever I'm given a telecom assignment, I'll brush it off and do the bare minimum. Please do do as much as you can. I know they will tell you don't do CSS, don't bother about testing. Please do that stuff. It's gonna make you stand out. Uh, right now, we have a huge pool of skilled engineers out there who are looking for jobs. You need to stand out. Uh, yeah, of course, mentorship. I did mention about mentorship. I'm I'm going back to mentorship this from February. That's from next week, I think, on ADP list and mentor list. So I'll put my calendars out there. If you want to talk, chat, we can plan that. Thank you. Uh, Madonna, I think you said everything, have built the same. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, also, Karanja was here. Maybe if you will ever listen, thank you to him. Uh, Kim, uh, I'll give the space back to Grace so that she can end and confirm that there is nothing else left out. Um, I think there's nothing else left. Um, I need to say thank you to all our speakers who have honored the space today. And for everyone else who has joined, we had a good number. Um, I know it's quite late. So thank you for sticking to the end of the session. Um, remember the ticket sale ends on 5th of February. So make sure you grab your ticket before then. And I'll see you on 17th. Thank you and have a good night. Ciao. Bye bye.